Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Marie Dorini. I'm the Administrative Director of the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination in Paris at Reed Hall. And it's a great, great pleasure to have so many of you join us tonight for a conversation between Fred Richin and Joao Pina. Um, that's uh, emerged from a more and more collaboration that we are doing with the Arts Arena and Columbia Global Centers at Reed Hall, although we're all in a virtual world now. This uh, has come from many conversations with Marjorie Aaron Sapphire over, over several months of how we can pair up her uh, wonderful uh, guests with uh, our wonderful fellows, and we're very fortunate to have fellows in real life as of January, including Joao, and an obvious uh, pairing were uh, between Fred and Joao, who, as it turns out, know each other already rather well. Um, and I will leave Marjorie uh, do the formal presentations, and I'd like to thank everybody who helped organize this event, James, Samantha, Sinead, and everybody at Reed Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Good evening. We're absolutely delighted to be partnering with the Institute for Ideas and Imagination, and we're grateful to Columbia Global Centers Paris for their technical support once again for this event. The title of tonight's conversation between photographer Jao Pina and scholar Fred Richin is The Useful Photographer. Already in this very young new year, we've had a dramatic example of what a useful photographer can be, and also a sad example of the absence of photographers. I'm referring first, of course, to the images, still or video, emanating from the January 6th attack on the US Capitol. Without them, we would not have understood the gravity of the frenzied onslaught by a ravenous mob. In the second case, I refer to the coronavirus pandemic. Every day we are given statistics, reminiscent to some of us of the body counts during the Vietnam War. But by definition, numbers are abstract. They do not conjure up a concrete image. Body bags do. Extenuated ICU staffers do. Dying people do. Given the enormity of the COVID crisis, we have a photographic void with precious few pictures testifying to the virus's ravages. Would the tragic, the virus is a hoax lie, have spread so virulently if confronted by a picture rather than a thousand numbers. Our guest tonight, freelance photographer Zhao Pina and Dean Emeritus of the International Center of Photography, Fred Richin, understand well the photographer's role in documenting political, societal, and humanitarian issues and in advocating for solutions. Zhao Pina began working as a professional pho photographer at the age of 18. His photographs have been published in the likes of the New York Times, The New Yorker, Newsweek, Stern, Time, El País, La Vanguardia, and Visao, and exhibited at galleries on three continents. His published books illustrate his concerns. The first, which I'm loosely translating as for your freedom of thought, features the stories of former Portuguese political prisoners it inspired an Amnesty International advertising campaign that earned him a gold lion in the 2011 Cannes Lions International Festival of Creativity and won the 2013 Open Societies Foundation's Moving Walls 21. Candor, the second book, documents the remnants of Operation Condor, a secret military program to eliminate opposition to the military dictatorships in South America during the 1970s. 46,750, or I don't know if I'm supposed to say 46,750, focuses on the urban violence in Rio de Janeiro and the city's transformation while preparing for the FIFA World Cup and the 2016 Olympic Games. 
a 2017 to 18 Nyman Fellow at Harvard University, a faculty member of the International Center of Photography in New York, and a regular lecturer and teacher of pho photography workshops, Zhao Pina is currently a fellow in residence at Columbia University's Institute for Ideas and Imagination here in Paris. Our second guest, Fred Richen, is no stranger to the arts arena. I remember the gasp in our audience years ago when he showed a picture of a tense line of belly down GIs with pointed machine guns ready to shoot, followed by the full wide angle of that same picture where we see the enemy, a line of photographers aiming back at the GIs, the only shooting coming from their cameras. His caveat, beware of manipulation, insist on seeing the full picture. Before becoming Dean of ICP, Fred Richen was professor of photography and imaging at NYU, where he co-founded what is now the Photography and Social Justice Program. He was picture editor of the New York Times Magazine, created the first multimedia version of the Times and its first nonlinear documentary online, Bosnia, Uncertain Paths to Peace, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in public service. His many collaborations on humanitarian campaigns include a project with the World Health Organization, UNICEF, Rotary, and the CDC to end polio globally. Another to advance the UN Millennium Development Goals. And it's still another, the Rwanda Project to support orphans of the genocide. The first of his seminal books on the future of imaging appeared way back in 1990. In Our Own Image, The Coming Revolution in Photography was followed in this century by After Photography and Bending the Frame, Photojournalism, Documentary, and the Citizen. I like to call Fred the guru of the digital revolution in photography. He speaks of paradigm shifts and ask questions such as, once we begin to live among synthetic images, how do we find our way back? The co-founder of pixelpress.org, he also helped found photodemic.org and the Screen Art School in Ireland and recently launched the website, thefifthcorner.org. Our guests will each speak and present images and then have a conversation together. I don't know what direction the conversation will take. I do know it is important to have a discussion like this at the start of this new year. We will conclude with the Q&A with the questions coming from you, the viewers. It is now my great pleasure to present to you Zhao Pina and Fred Richen Zhao Pino in Paris and Fred Richen in New York, talking about the useful photographer. Hello, uh, hi Marjorie, hi Marie and everybody on the other side that we can't see. Uh, it's a true pleasure to be here tonight. In my case tonight, Fred's afternoon. And it's an amazing honor to be sharing uh, these thoughts with Fred who I've been, I've been reading and, and listening for a while now. Uh, yeah, so just to give a little bit of background of where I started as a photographer. Uh, my, in my case, I started in working as a professional photographer in 1999 uh, when there was still mostly film. So I started actually in an, as a, an intern in a newspaper and a, and a magazine, a music magazine and photographing mostly Chrome. And so I, can, I come from that idea that photography and in my case photojournalism it, it was meant to be seen in pages of magazines and newspapers uh, but that has been shifting fortunately i would say but that has been shifting with time uh, mostly because of the way we consume news and the way we consume photography these days and that has been my trigger in order to like 
constantly be uh, asking myself what what am I doing and how do I want to see and project my work. So I'm going to start by sharing some images which I hopefully are more interesting than looking at my face. So uh, I think everybody could see it. Uh, so basically I started out as someone who wanted to be where the news was. I started out to report as a reporter and I am I still consider myself to be a, a reporter although the venues where I've used to show my work are now shrinking every day and by the day in their budgets in the number of pages that newspapers and magazines have so that has forced me into having to reinvent myself and to keep thinking how the work that I do, how a professional photographer is still relevant and how the work of a photographer is useful. Uh, this picture was taken exactly today, 10 years ago, and it was taken in Tahrir Square in Cairo, in Egypt, during the Arab Spring. And it was one of those moments where I felt I was the luckiest person on earth, that I was able to go there I was able to see what's going on, to witness, to photograph, and to come back. And it, that sort of, from there, I went to Tunisia first, then went to Egypt, and then crossed to Libya uh, to keep photographing this wave of revolutions that would hopefully bring democracy and prosperity to these countries. 10 years later, of course, the reality is very different, but it was very interesting to witness uh, that and that was my primary goal was to be a witness of history and today more than ever what I'm doing or how am I thinking about my work is not so much of how it will look on tomorrow's newspaper or next week's news magazine but more of how it be looked like in 20, 30, 40 years from now when we look at these events as historical events that has for some reason marked uh, a moment in, in time and change somehow realities uh, for sure what we're living today and how, how marjorie has mentioned what happened in the in the u.s congress on january 6th and the crisis that we've been living over the almost past year with the coronavirus are certainly some of those events unfortunately we have limited time so i decided to stick to sort of like three ways that I've, I'm working. The first one, as I would say, I would be going into news events, going to places where I was interested in what was going on and report from that. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, so this brought me to many places around the world, but also to start focusing on areas or stories that I was particularly keen on speaking. So in my, for personal reasons, and the fact that I have been working on, uh, in and around the dictatorships and the historical memories of dictatorships for 20 years now, uh, has brought me a lot to these places where history is always on the fringe of being a democracy or like the case in North Africa and the Middle East with, um, with the Arab Spring, uh, that we, for a moment, we thought that regimes that were dictatorial were going to turn into full democracies. And some of that happened, some of that didn't. And others, which in the case of Cuba are, have been dictatorial regimes for a very long time, uh, have also fascinated me. I first went to Cuba in 1987 as a child with my parents, and I have been fascinated ever since by the island, by their resilience, by the regime, and also by the way that the US foreign policy has been affecting that regime and that 10 million people who live in the island for so long. So I've been always interested in those moments, and then in particular moments like the death of Fidel Castro in 2016 where I flew to the island uh, to, in order to cover the funeral, which was sort of like a central part of what I've been working there for almost 20 years now. And with a non-stop project like others that I will show. But Cuba's awake of Fidel's death was something very interesting to me, not only 
historically speaking, but also visually for my own project. There's sort of like the middle page of my project on the Cuba's evolving changes uh, over the past 20 years and hopefully for the next 20 and see how that plays off in terms of visuals and the, the fact that the country might uh, change into a certain direction or not, we, we don't know, but I'm interested in that. I'm particularly interested in understanding those shifts. And I'm interested in that because I'm interested in, interested in history more than in pure journalism these days. Uh, I'm really interested in how things happened in, in, in my case, in my country, uh, over 40 years ago when we as a, a dictatorship uh, in Portugal created a revolution that fortunately was peaceful and brought democracy. I've been working around that subject for a while and that has brought me into other uh, realities and that, that has brought me into places that are often not as peaceful and not as safe as the environments that I grew up with. And this brings me to Rio uh, that Marjorie also mentioned, 46,750 is a project that I've worked on for 10 years. And that number, which is 46,000 people, are the number of people who were murdered in the 10 years that I was working in the city. Uh, so I was going in and around Rio to try to document these snippets of daily life mixed with endemic violence that exists in the city. And at the same time, try to gain perspective and hope for what the future would bring. And in the 10 years that I've worked there, which were from early 2007 to late 2016, uh, there was a, tr a whole curve going up with Rio and Brazil being in the an enormous economical boom and the city was changing. But at the same time, the levels of violence and the levels of murder and really hard life for a lot of people haven't changed much throughout those years. Although people in the south side of the city, which is the more wealthy part, were very, were feeling much safer and were very happy for that and they could travel and they could consume more. People were living in the north side of the city and the other regions, the more suburban areas of Rio, were really feeling this pressure of the economical pressure, the police pressure, corruption pressure, all of that playing in what's called the favelas or the slums of Rio. And the fact is that huge parts of territory were being controlled by gangs like this in this photograph. Uh, that controlled the lives of thousands and thousands of people. And I was interested in like understanding how was this possible? And I forgot to mention, I didn't forgot, but my true interest in photography is not the act of making a photograph per se, but more of the excuse that it provides me to, let's say, go to Rio, go to this area, go and speak to these people with the excuse that I'm there reporting, that I'm there taking photographs, but what I'm really deeply interested in, it's not in taking a photograph, it's in getting to know these people, getting to understand them or try to understand them and their lives. And I'm mentioning this because right now, what I, the way I'm feeling we are living it, we're living in a highly judgmental uh, times where everybody throughout social media is, come, is living on their own bubble and criticizing and critiquing everybody for many reasons, most of them moral reasons based on our own biases. But it's very hard, it's very easy to say, oh, these guys are thugs and these guys are carrying rifles and putting terror in families and in the whole parts of the city. Yes, it's true. But at the same time, these people are humans with families, with girlfriends with kids and how is it to grow up in those environments how is it to be under that level of pressure the guy in the center here i took this photograph in the days of his birthday in 2008 he didn't make it to the next birthday because he was executed by the police a few months after this picture was taken uh, so those are the fringes that i'm interested in, but i'm also interested in the other side i'm also interested in going to the police and see how is it to be a policeman in Rio, for example, the city where the most policemen get killed 
and the city where the, the police kills the most in the world. For you guys to have an idea, just to give you a perspective, uh, Rio, the Rio metropolitan area has about 11 million people. The United States has 300 million people. There is more, there's three times more cops being killed in Rio de Janeiro alone than in the whole United States, United States together. At the same time, there is by far the police in Rio kills the most people every year, about over a thousand people every year registered the paperwork uh, for executions, basically, so-called uh, uh, arrested to, uh, resistant to arrest, uh, which in basically it's executions made by the police. So for about 10 years, I tried to go in and out and I'm, I'm extending a little bit too, too long on those photographs. But just to give you an idea that I go into the news places, but I also go into the places where there are no press. So there's very little press working deeply around certain subjects. And I like to go in, I like to try to understand where the, where the issues are and try to go and photograph them in order to create a body of work that hopefully will be able to bridge. And that was to get to the point to explain how do I think that I can be useful as a photographer these days. I certainly cannot compete to anyone with a cell phone when a news event is happening because everybody now can have, can take an image of that news event. It's not the photojournalists that are called and they're the, the first ones there and they have exclusive photographs. No, everybody, are everybody is making photographs and videos right now but i think me as a photographer i can study i can go in deep i can commit to a certain subject and i can spend time on it trying to digest it and trying to bridge that reality into the viewer's reality which is very different for i would say most of us sitting here tonight uh that have been we do have a home to stay we do have a meal to eat which are oftentimes very different from the realities that I photograph. So I try to be a bridge between those realities and the viewers of these images on these other sides of the world. Uh, that's once. And the second sort of like idea that I keep having in my mind is how can I, in the notion of phot photographs that are being made today, how can I show my work or try to differentiate my work from so many pho photographs that we are seeing either on social media, on the press, uh, in, in, many, in many places. And in my case, the, the questions or the answers I have for those questions is that my images no longer need to be in one certain outlet. I don't need to publish this photograph in a newspaper and that's it. I can, that this image, this particular image can have different life, a lifespan that not only goes to the press, but can only, can also go to a gallery, can also live inside of a museum, can also go into someone's house as a collector. So can also live on my Instagram account or on social media. So these different outlets, I think it's what's spreading out work and important work to be seen by different people at different times. So I think these are as of like the news and digesting the news and trying to put that in perspective for the future. And then this is the last body of work that I'm showing here, uh, which is my book or part of my book of operation, about Operation Condor and the military dictatorships. Uh, which is what I consider to be my slow pace in photography. It's the, where I'm going from like full gear speed on like news events and trying to meet deadlines and photograph into taking the foot off, stopping and thinking, what do I want to say? And Marjorie briefly introduced this, but this was the, the, the story about the disappeared in many countries in South America, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Brazil, and that's it. And the fact that those six countries have created a military operation in order to eliminate their political opposition. And this would happen in the 70s. I was not even born, but I was fascinated by this story and the fascinated by the fact this even happened and it was practically impossible to create the body of work back then about this, but I had the time and the urge and the, the energy 
to go around, and I've lived in Argentina for a very long time, to develop this project and to use Argentina as a base for the region uh, to photograph people that have been affected by Operation Condor, to photograph the families that this has appeared, to photograph the survivors of Operation Condor, and also to go to the places of torture and disappearance in order to photograph and document what had happened there many years back. So it's also, I think, photography and the way memory works. It's fascinating to me, the fact that most of our memories, they are frozen in still images. If we think of, or in my case, that might be a professional defect, but if I think of an event, most of the times I think of a still frame. I don't think of moving image. I don't think of sound. I think of a photograph to reflect upon that event. So I try to use those memories from those survivors, from those families that disappeared in order to go back and register and document what had happened there many years before. So I, for about nine years between the year 2005 and 2014, I went slowly, very slowly into some of these places, interviewed the survivors, photographed them, got their record, also tried to go to the other side and spoke actually to a few military personnel, one on the record who, who had been a member of Operation Condor, but also documented different events like the one on this photograph of a funeral of someone who had been disappeared 30 years earlier and the body was finally identified and returned, the bones returned to the family so they could finally uh, have a proper funeral and have a, a burying ground for their loved ones. This was Horacio Bao in Treleu in Argentina, in the south of Argentina, in the Patagonia region. And it was actually fascinating to see that moment 30 years later and the pain that certainly turns into a form of celebration as well. So the useful photographer, again, just this idea of how can I be of usage to anything is also to take the time in the moment where we're all fast pacing on screens all, all day or most of the day and just like stop and contemplate what's ahead of me, what's in front of me and try to frame that into a certain into a certain manner that will create this register, that will create this document that hopefully can be seen by people and people will relate and will engage with stories. Because I think overall what we're talking about is storytelling and how can we still engage in telling people stories. Although most of us, I would say, probably are not buying the newspaper every day right now, we still want to know what's going on. And I think at least in my case, I want to go what's going on in a much more slow paced and profound and deep connection to the stories that I'm reading. So I'm mostly reading long form. I'm mostly watching long form as well. I'm when I'm thinking about a project, I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to see this in 20 minutes. I want to spend a few hours, a few days and sometimes a few weeks looking at these images or reading this book or reading this text or watching this movie in order to relate to what's there, in order to really try to get deep and deep into these stories. And then I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit into the last image, just to also say, how can we be useful as photographers? Uh, just to give you a, a, a little break through these images, this we're looking at images of survivors, places, survivors again, places. And this is throughout six different uh, countries in a whole subcontinent uh, that was totally smashed or yeah, smashed by these events that took place 40 years ago. And we thought, no, oh, but that's history, but it's not because the fact that this has happened, it still has very vivid marks on societies. The fact that the police is able to kill 1,000 people in Rio every year, to me is a direct connection for the military dictatorship and the impunity created, not only during the, the military dictatorship, of course, the colonial period has a huge role on that too, but the impunity factor 
still plays a major role on how these societies today live and how their memories live. So it's the permanent game of trying to do it right, but at the same time, other forces that try to gain it back in terms of like control. And this, I think, visually can be powerful to tell so people can understand that. And I've had the chance, for example, to show this body of work at the US Naval Academy, which was directly involved with Operation Condor and the CIA and the Dirty War. And it was fascinating to see the cadets' reaction to this and like understanding that actions that we take, they keep having a resonance many, many years later. Uh, and this was the image that I'm, I'm finishing and also an example of what a useful photographer can be. This image was taken in Bahia Blanca in the in Buenos Aires province, about four, hour, four hours away from the city of Buenos Aires. And this was during a trial that was being held there for 17 men accused of crimes against humanity. And the day I gain access to this trial and were able to photograph they all started not all but most of them started covering their faces and i took photographs of it also some of them without the face without the the faces being hidden but i decided to select this image and start working with this image and funny enough the human rights movements in argentina actually appropriated this photograph and started taking this image into the into the trials in argentina in order to like show how like shame could could look like, uh, and it's very interesting the the whole polarization that's happening worldwide. But Argentina is no different in terms of like oh we were fighting a threat, a communist threat, and they obviously used excessive force to do that, and they practices crimes against humanity, including uh, kidnapping children. And it's very interesting to see how they say they were doing it for a cause, but at once you went through the room and you raise a camera, they start hiding from it. So the shame plus the slash um, pride plays an interesting factor there too. So yeah, this I'm gonna stop sharing now and pass the word to Fred, but was just an, a, a snippet of how I'm working and what I do in terms of like current events and, and historical events. Uh, yeah, on to you, Fred. Thank you for, for listening, everybody. Okay, thank you, Joao. And I'll try to, you know, just, just keep it going. Um, you know, there are several ideas that, that, that resonate in terms of what I'm going to be speaking about as well. You know, when I was picture editor of the New York Times Magazine in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, the, the, it, it was a very different era than the era we are in today in multiple ways. So I think the best way is really just to, to start sharing my screen and, and showing you what I mean. Um, so this is the 2021 edition of the Useful Photographer, meaning that you know it's time specific, it's also, also culturally specific. One could be useful, as Joao was pointing out, in different countries in different ways. Um, it's not the same global media sense that one might assume it is. It's, it's certain images are iconic and powerful in certain countries and not in other countries. So this is, you know, kind of where we're coming from What Marjorie alluded to the, the Vietnam War, which was considered the apex of photography in terms of deconstructing a conflict, in terms of being sardonic uh, in terms of being critical, in terms of not just accepting what one is told. But in those days, we had a front page. We had front page of newspapers, magazines. And as a front page, it managed to focus society. You know, whether one agreed or disagreed with policies, there were certain basic facts that were shared and basic images that became iconic and were shared. And this was very, very different than flipping an image on Instagram. You know, for example, a girl being napalmed on the bottom right on Instagram, where you look at it for a second or a half a second and flip it away, it becomes obscene. Uh, it loses a kind of sacred presence to it. it. You know, earlier we had this idea that we would read 
different newspapers, but have similar sense of what's going on. We could share the facts. We were not fact challenged uh, in the same way that we are today. And, you know, if you take climate change, the environment, this is 1968, the photograph of Earthrise by an astronaut. And this is 16 months later, Earth Day began every April. It was on postage stamps. It became iconic for the, you know, the fragility of the earth, what we have to do to help protect it. And nowadays there are very, very few iconic images in part it's social media, it's, it's very lateral, horizontal. The iconic in, in, implies a hierarchy. It's coming from above, you know, like in the Catholic church or, or in the older idea of news media. You know, now we have the occasional iconic image but to me, if I had to think of a global iconic image over the last decade, this is probably the only one. If you take, for example, the US war in Afghanistan, which is the longest war in American history, there are no iconic images from it, which is very, very different than the Vietnam War. There's an illusion that photography has a usefulness in pulling us together the way it did to a certain extent that that is true, but in many, many ways it's been transformed. <clears throat> and in fact, you know, much as, as Joas mentioned is coming from social media. So there's billions of people with cameras, um, you know, in the world, and there's very, very few uh, professional photographers, people working on long term projects. So th this, you know, 17 year old young woman who, who managed to make this video, which to me is the most important imagery of 2020 in the United States of, of George Floyd being basically executed by the police, you know, did a lot. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter was just nominated for Nobel Prize. Um, and I think these kinds of imagery, often video, not photography at this point, because there's a narrative. The video uh, gives you a sense of a beginning, middle, and end, and the photograph is a fragment, and it's decontextualized often. So we don't know where it's coming from, what it's about, and so often now online is the videos that work. But there's other things going on that I think we have to pay attention to. This painting was sold to Christie's in 2018 for 45 times the amount of money they thought it would be sold at. It was around $432,000. But this was not made by a painter. This was made by an algorithm from a, uh, a group called Obvious. And Christie's expected it would sell between seven and ten thousand dollars, and it sold at forty-three times its estimate. When I was in Russia recently, they were about to show this painting at the Hermitage in Saint Petersburg. So there's a sense that in in the arts, in music, in in painting, in in many of the arts, as well as you know many many other functions, that the algorithms now are more and more important, you know, which, which raises the question of what does a human being do with all this? The great vast majority of photographs taken today are being made by machines for other machines, you know, license plates, detectors, they, the, the code becomes important, not the image, a facial surveillance and so on. The photographers are a small fraction of the imagery being made. So for example, this is you know, just one site in Argentina where you get almost 3 million free artificially intelligence generated photos. Photo is the wrong word, it's not a photograph. These are synthetic images. And you could go in, you could ask for a natural left-facing young person. You could ask for a beautified left-facing young person. You could ask for a beautified left-facing young black person. You could ask for a beautified, infant, joyful person, whatever you want. And they're being advertised so that companies can look diverse. You put these synthetic imagery in, you put in some people from diverse backgrounds, supposedly, who don't exist, and you look diverse. They're being used by universities, they're being used in art schools, they're being used for human relations resources. So now we're going to have an enormous influx, both in video, they're called deep, deep fakes in synthetic imagery, of presidents declaring war, of uh, actresses put against, without their knowledge in, in pornographic movies, 
with our third grade teacher being put in a pornographic movie. There's a free for all that's, that, that's been emerging and in which people like Joao's imagery are gonna have to compete. So what we look for then is, is kind of, what I do is to look for impactful work, not just beautiful work, strong work, great work, the work that wins prizes, but the work that changes the world for the better. That's what I'm always trying to figure out. Much of photography is reactive. You wait for the apocalypse and you photograph it. There's very little photography that is proactive. There's thousands of books or at least hundreds of books of war photography, and there's almost no books of peace photography. We're not so good at trying to prevent or diminish the apocalypse, but we're very good at imaging when it happens. This is an exception. The work by Gideon Mendel, he's originally from South Africa, lives in London. There was a very racist assumption by Western governments and NGOs that Africans would not take antiretroviral drugs for HIV if they were given them. They were not disciplined enough. So he went to a pilot project in South Africa for four years and watched what happened as people did take the medicine and then recovered and were able to work, to be parents, to, to live a life. And because of that, I asked the UNAIDS, 8 million people are in treatment today because of his photographs. So by working proactively, instead of waiting for the people to get sicker and sicker and making very graphic images, he was able to diminish the horror that might have ensued, prevent many people from getting sick and dying, and making images that are rather prosaic, that do not win the awards, but are a different idea. Can photography be proactively used with climate change? How would that work? What about racism? How would that work? And so on. There's a lot of conceptual work being done as well. In the US, people about to be executed have the right to a last meal. It's usually a very low budget, but they get to choose it before they're executed. So this is called Howard Jones's Ask Last Meal. And what Amnesty did was they asked James Reynolds, the photographer who worked on this, Celia Shapiro, there are several who've done this kind of work. They recreate the menus. But some of these people were executed and then later determined to be innocent, usually because of DNA. So he, this was this man's last meal in 2000. And 10 years later, he was presumed to be innocent. So David Spence, this is his last meal. And 13, and three years later, he was presumed to be innocent. This was his last meal. And 12 years later, he was presumed innocent. So for me, I've often looked at these images and said, if it was my last meal, what would I order? From these images, you have a sense that it's, it's not necessarily the filet mignon crowd that is being executed. There's a class issue here. Certainly there's a low budget. You're not allowed to ask for a cigarette. There's no smoking in these last meals. But you also see something about, you know, who are the people getting executed? And then Amnesty took the project and said, that was his last meal, but he never should have been executed. He was always innocent or the Blue Skies by Anton Kusters. What he did was he went and photographed a blue sky over 1,078 World War II concentration camps. The idea being that we've seen many images of the people victimized in concentration camps. And in some ways we defend against them now. But by seeing the blue skies 1,078 times, we can remember and think, you know, as Roland Barth's idea of the active reader, we could put ourselves into the image and say, I have a blue sky over me today. I wonder what evil is being done to Syrian refugees, to the people who are being discriminated against, put in concentration camps today. And it comes a little bit from this Elie Wiesel quote, 
and you'll hear in the background a tone. And every time you hear the tone, there's an Excel sheet that goes with the exhibit and it goes from 12 years, 1933 to 45. And every time that you hear a tone, when you're watching the images, looking at the blue skies, another person has died. And it varies by pitch. And the pitch are linked to different concentration camps. But, you know, as we're, as I'm talking, four people, have, five people, have just six people have just died. So that there's an ability to extend the medium. This is a Swiss publication that ran all 1,078 blue skies. It's a project that took Anton Kusters to Belgium about five and a half years. He drove about 200,000 kilometers to do it, and but he would only do the blue skies. This is the book that he published, and the book, every page is 10 days with blue skies as different concentration camps open. This is also the use of virtual reality. The UN had the idea for Syrian refugees that there was a meeting in Kuwait of major funders. And oftentimes people do not visit the refugee camps, but they felt by using virtual reality, they could bring people there. We walk for days crossing the desert to Jordan. The week we left, my kite got stuck in a tree in our yard. I wonder if it is still there. I want it back. <laughs> My name is Sidra. I am 12 years old. I am in the fifth grade. I am from Syria in the Dara province in Hill City. I have lived here in the Zaatari camp in Jordan for the last year and a half. I have a big family, three brothers. One is a baby. He cries a lot. I asked my father if I cried when I was a baby and he says, I did not. I think I was a stronger baby than my brother. And the argument here is that the expectation was at the conference they would raise $2.2 so $2 billion for Syrian refugees. And instead they raised $3.8 billion, billion dollars. So it's $1.6 billion that it is at least partially attributed to the virtual reality because the feeling was that there's a kind of an empathy, there's a kind of control, you're not looking at it, you're much more within it. So people in, in the field I'm in, you know, I just did a, something at the Sundance Film Festival, we used augmented reality, virtual reality, photography, statistics, maps, aerial imagery. It was about, still here, is about uh, women of color in the US who were getting out of, of prisons. Um, we're doing many things. In this case, it's Disturb, it's a Paris-based group and a photojournalist. And what they do is say, if people aren't reading the newspapers and magazines, we'll bring it to them. You know, this is a uh, sexual abuse, Iman Halal's photograph from, from Cairo. And here it is in Norway in a skateboard park. So they'll bring it to people. Often there's a barcode, you could use your cell phone, hear the photographer talking about it. They have contracts with French schools uh, for children. So they put up one photograph per month and they bring somebody to talk about it so that the outside world is brought to you if you're not gonna come to it. Um, you know, from, and, and they've done it in many campaigns, climate change, you know, many kinds of campaigns. And then just to finish up a few images uh, because of time reasons, one of the things I try to do is to use the digital differently. What can we do to correct some of the problems that we have in the imagery? There's a lot of feeling that portraiture, we take pictures, it's kind of colonial, it's aggressive, it's freezing, capturing, you know, Sontag's critique, other people's critique. So my students do things like interactive portraits. You make a portrait of somebody, you turn your camera around, you show it to them and you say, does this represent you? And then they respond and you record it so the reader can, can listen to what 
the person thinks of it. Do you think that photo represents you? No, because I'm a smiling person. I actually like um, to be smiling, you know? I, I do that just about most of the day. Do you think this is a photo that depicts you? That says who you are? No. Why not? Because I don't think any picture ever will. This is another uh, former student of mine, Jose Rivas, who's in, uh, a Native American. And what he does is he creates ceremonies for the portraits. He sees them as a ritual. His idea is that he wants to give the power to the subject, not to him. You know, that, that it, it, it's a kind of traditional ceremony, the portraiture, you know, coming out of this idea of being interactive. So can we do this, you know, with somebody, for example, who's a refugee, who's homeless, who doesn't have power in society, agency, can photographers start to make imagery and collaborate with the subject? Is this you? Does this represent you? Not just people, you know, with, with affluence, with power, but people without power. How would that work? This is a former student of mine uh, from India living in Texas, and she made an interactive self-portrait. about her feeling about living in the United States and Texas at this point with her husband. Uh, and then lastly, you know, I have this, you know, what Marjorie referred to that was in Haiti, the, the photograph of the US invasion and what you don't see. So there's a software for corners that we developed, um, which you contextualize your images. So the reader could click on any of the corners and find out the backstory related imagery, the authorship links, is room for the photographer to put their code of ethics. You know, I'm a fashion photographer. I don't work with underweight models, you know, and, and, and down, you know, all, all kinds of different kinds of ethics. So the photographer's ethical code is available to the reader immediately. So for example, in the US, there was a hashtag, if they gun me down for young African-American men and women, the feeling is that the, the pictures that are circulated, if somebody is killed by the police, tends to be the so-called gangster image, quote unquote. And instead, like in Four Corners, what you can do is, here's the backstory, what's really going on, and here's the, the related imagery. This is his high school graduation or, or college graduation. So this is not necessarily the gangster anymore. This is him. So you could fight back at the way the media characterizes you, which is often stereotypical and often racist. And then finally, as Marjorie mentioned, I, I launched last month a website called thefifthcorner.org, you know, where I put a lot of these ideas. There's a whole section on innovative projects, new strategies, how do you do it differently? You know, there are many, many more than we have time to talk about now. And I just wanted to end with this quote from the New York Times the other day. The President Biden wants to bring extremists and conspiracy theorists back to reality. He can start by making that reality worth coming back to. And so to me, this is a challenge to media. Instead of concentrating on the horrors, the, the apocalypse, the, the abnormalities, the, the, but also the sense of what works. You know, what do we have to live for? What is good? You know, how do we solve the things? How can we be proactive instead of reactive? How could we rethink things? Because in fact, I think many countries you know, including the United States right now, have a real problem with reality. We no longer agree on what is real. And, and as a democracy, as a society, it is impossible to move forward. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. <clears throat> as well, we're supposed to talk to each other. Yes, <laughs> which I'll very gladly do. Uh, there's actually something that you've mentioned, uh, and that's something that I've had in my mind for a while. It's this idea of impact, right? Uh, that we must or we ought to create impact with our work. Uh, but we oftentimes focus on what is the global impact. And you just showed us some really incredible examples. I knew most of them before. Uh, but I think we sort of forgot the essence of photographer or, or the photographer 
in the very anthropological way, which is like to connect with our own realities, our the the realities that we were most times born, lived, and died with. I'm thinking, for example, of the like small studio photographer in like the small village in the interior of the U.S. that would photograph from like the baby to that baby becoming an adult, getting married, and eventually even to his or her own funeral. And that would certainly create memories for a whole village or for a whole city. And that's pretty much gone as we know it. Uh, what do you think we could think of in order to like regain some of that? Uh, a friend of mine who's an amazing photo editor in Portugal, Luis Vasconcelos, he, out of his own will, basically dived into an archive of a local, from a village, a small city of, I would say, 10 to 15,000 people. And he had photographed like three generations, the photographer passed away, and the family didn't know what to do with the archive. So Louise went in and literally spent, I think, over a year looking and editing everything into a book. And it was like this really amazing album of images from this city that a guy that i have never heard about of and he was a fantastic photographer and now we have some of those examples but always in a global scale what i'm thinking is how can we sort of like draw a plan to save those archives and save those amazing bodies of work that are all there laying and dying most of them no, i think that's the, the other side of the coin is how do we make imagery also from the outside that adds to, let's say, collective memory, what you're talking about with those archives. You know, John Berger has the idea that how do we avoid spectacle is that the, uh, is that the photographer photographs for the community itself that he or she is photographing, in other words, for their family album. He doesn't photograph for the outside world. The outside world could look at it, but instead of trying to make the images, you know, which is often a spectacle for the outside world, the exotic, you know, the... To the stereotypical it, version. Well, it's, it's the, the outside world stereotype of it. How do you photograph for the insiders? And so then that conjoins with what you're talking about, which is also how do you hybridize media? So to me, the best possible case is the insider working with the outsider. So how do you take one of those albums that you're talking about by the small town person, wherever, and then how do you combine that with the outsider? And with digital, it's very easy to do that. You, you can have two narratives, you can roll over one picture and see the other picture you know, Joao, you go to a small town in wherever, in Texas, and then you roll over your picture online and underneath it is a picture by the local photographer made 10 years before in the same place, or 20 years before, 50 years before, whatever it would be. You know, because we tend to ghettoize, we tend to say, that's an amateur, you're a professional, you know, but we don't conjoin the two. We don't use social media for creating billions and billions of images a day we don't even know what's there and what's useful. Like what I do with students is I have them curate social media from their own countries or cities to tell us what's going on. And I often learn more that way than I do in any newspaper or magazine because you know, they show stuff that they know is important but the outside person doesn't know it's important. You know, just one example is I had a photographer from a student from China and he picked a picture of middle-aged people holding hands in the middle of the street in the middle of the day. And I said, what's that about? And he said, they're stopping traffic. I said, why? He said, because their kids are taking the exam to the university in the building next door and they want it to be perfectly quiet. I said, I learned more from that picture about you know, families and what they feel than I do from all the news coverage. So you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done in both directions. And I think local people, you know, university students, high school students, old age home, people in old age homes should be curating that kind of stuff you're talking about, social media, the local studio photographer, whoever it is, and making it public so that we have a much better sense of each other in much more depth and complexity. 
Yeah, and, and I don't want to turn this into an interview or, or, or anything like that, but it's funny, it's interesting that you mentioned that because everything that comes to my mind is the decline that we're living on the media. So I would say when I started working, you would have a major event and you would have the big names, the New York Times and CNN, everybody was going there. You would have like smaller newspapers and TVs that were also going there or no longer are going there. And then you would have local media. And I think a major problem is also that because of this ongoing struggle, local media has mostly disappeared. The mid mid-sized media is really struggling to survive. So no one can send anyone. I know of newspapers in Portugal that they can send someone 30 kilometers away because they can't afford to pay for transportation. So the, the fact that the, the ways we are reporting, professionally speaking, as you mentioned, have been completely changed. And now only the CNNs and New York Times and the big names are going out there with their very specific agenda I, and i don't want to call it an agenda in a bad way but with their very biased vision over what's going on over the world because they're mostly white they're mostly male they're mostly from a developed country looking at situations that are very different from their their own so there's that gap missing of like someone that can translate from the local reality the the middle-aged couple holding hands and stopping trafficking and showing us the beauty and the simplicity of that because it's not a breaking news story. It's not dramatic. It doesn't bleed, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. And that idea of calling people's attention to the news most, of, most times from very dramatic stories, which I think are important, but I think is also pushing a lot of people away from looking at the news and looking at stories because they we we don't want to be submerged in like misery every day right so how do we find a balance on that how do we bring that back into like the local translating into the the global i think that's those are issues that are always in my mind and especially in a project that i'm working on right now uh that develops in cape verde but goes it goes back to the last 80 years and the history of colonialism and fascism and now democracy and and visual memory let's put it like this so yeah I, it's something that it's been in my mind like what can i say here that hasn't been told but at the same time i don't want necessarily to be doing something that's going to have a global impact like what gideon did which was amazing but i want like maybe a small group of a hundred people that really relate to that story to both understand but also have a word to say and i think what you mentioned and what you showed us collaboration between subjects and photographers and or documentarians or whatever uh it's super important because i don't see it as working for a major audience i'm seeing it so people have sort of like their memories frozen in one photograph. Yeah, but I think the role of the photographer is changing in that sense that, you know, like in cinema, it's often a crew that works together. It's not usually one person. So when I worked on the project last year for Sundance, you know, the major visual was Google images of, from the air of American prisons jails and detention centers. In the US, we have more prisons, jails, and detention centers than colleges and universities. So we, we made an enormous wall. It's by Josh Begley, B-E-G-L-E-Y. He has a website just filled with these thousands of images. And it was extraordinary. And he didn't have to go anywhere to do it. That imagery worked. I think the same, like I was saying with social media, is we don't curate it. We don't use it. like. You know, if I wanted to know daily life in my neighborhood, maybe I can go on social media and find a bunch of imagery from different people. So then you have multiple voices, multiple perspectives in which you're the lead photographer, you're the lead vision, you're the backbone of it. But, you know, there's there are a lot of other resources in the US. We're finding a lot of 
colleges and universities, their newspapers are now becoming the local newspapers mm -hmm. because like you say, I agree that the local newspapers cannot survive. So I think we're looking for a paradigm shift in multiple ways of how we tell the stories of the world at this point. You know, it's, it's again, going back to the, you know, if I had to do a project on racism in the United States in the last year, I could not do it without amateur media. I could not do it with only professionals. Uh, you know, it has to be from multiple points of view. The Abu Ghraib pictures of, you know, of torture were made by soldiers. You know, there are many, yeah. many cases now in which we, we have to use other points of view um, as well. So I agree with I, I don't think we, we, I think we not only have to, it's like, it's impossible to think otherwise that the formula of sending the foreign reporter in to that's gone. I think that's like right. totally died. And now it's about cura It's not only about the photographer needs to be a curator basically and curating and it's also an art form in itself, as you know, much better than I do. Uh, so the thing is how to, because everybody right now can do an interesting photograph. I think we can all agree to that, but it's how to contextualize it. And the fact that a photograph, and there's the cliche a photograph is worth a thousand words, but a photograph without the proper context in the current media where like fake news and people put, and I think rightfully so, put into question a lot of what they see uh, because of, not only the whole technological aspect, but also the whole uh, the whole populism wave, basically covering our democratic societies. And so, how do you question and how do you answer those questions in terms of like what is truth and what is right? And so, at the same time, there is this huge wave of moralism. And that uh, you shouldn't be photographing this because of that. But I think those moralists, and let me call them like that, oftentimes come from a very specific background and they judge from their own very specific background. Uh, and how do you, how to create a balance on that? You know, like me personally as a photographer, sometimes I feel myself self-censoring because I don't think I should be the one doing this specific story. Uh, and if I think it clearly, that's weird. I think we should all photograph the stories that we feel passionate about. Uh, but at the same time, there might be other people who are more uh, equipped to do it and how to, how to balance it. So I think it's all, always a matter of balance right now uh, because there's a lot of, hysteria on like trying to create agendas and to push progressive and conservative agendas into what we're doing that I'm oftentimes confused about how should I continue. But I, in, I'm sorry, Fred, go ahead. Let me just say this quickly. There's, we, we did an entire town hall about that recently. I, I think there's a predatory photographer, somebody who takes advantage coming in with preconceptions. You know, I'm going to the favela in Brazil and all I wanna see is murder, horror, bloodshed and all this. Whether that's a Brazilian doing it or a non-Brazilian, it's problematic. I think there has to be a transparency of, you know, who are you, why you're doing it, what are you doing? You have to provide a context for it. And there, there's also an issue of being open to understanding. You know, I would love right now you know, that if 12 photographers from any country in the world would come to the US and tell us, what are we doing? Yeah, I we agree. We don't know what we're doing. Um, you know, if it's 12 Portuguese photographers, that would be great. Or 12 Nigerian photographers, that would be great. Or a combination. You know, Robert Frank probably made the best document in the United States and he was Swiss, the Americans. So we need the insider and the outsider, but we need a generosity of spirit, not a kind of a mercenary approach in which I'm going to the Arab Spring just to photograph de devastation and horror and craziness. But I want to understand culture. I want to understand politics. I want to, you know, I often point to a, a photograph made, we did a project on Iraqi civilians making their own pictures. And the most important picture of the Iraq war to me is somebody going to the dentist. 
because they're just like us. They're not exotic and crazy. They're just like us. It's different. And Marjorie, I'm sorry, I missed, I, I was, go ahead. No, we've had some questions come in. So I just wanted to um, uh, jump a little bit to, to that. I'm summarizing them and paraphrasing somewhat. Fred, first of all, when you said, um, why do boys go in and, and do the pho photographs of the blood, the horror and everything, um, I would just remind you that Satan is always the most interesting character in a play. Um, I think that there's a, a real tendency for that, whether it's in real life or whether it's in, in fiction. But you had mentioned the question of artificial intelligence and synthetic images. And going back to the question that I sort of rhetorically asked in my introduction about what if we had had pictures that really showed the suffering of COVID-19, could that have done something to counter the um, the uh, the lie about it's being a a hoax and they just told okay just to put on my video could that counter the idea of it's being a hoax and my answer would have been those people probably would have said it was photoshopped so what do you do talking about your reality question what do you do when you have the synthetic images when they can be so manipulated how do you use photography to document, this is also for you, Zhao, because you're talking about being a historical photographer and documenting quote unquote reality. How can you do that today without, again, Fred, going back to your reference of without having a front page, without having essentially a curator, an editor, or an authority? No, it, it's, it's, it, there's multiple answers. Uh, to it, um, you know, one thing that I think photographers have to do more and more is contextualize. If you just put a picture online, it gets recontextualized, decontextualized, and can mean almost anything for different people. So that's one of the issues. Um, the code of ethics, you could click and go to the photographer's homepage, like in Joao's case, and see the many projects he's done and have a sense where he's coming from. Can I believe this guy? I did a project in Iraq with a photographer um, and you know he reported every Friday from a one group of Marines and this, this group of parents of Marines, family of Marines checked us out to see our politics. They, they knew they didn't agree, but they figured we were trustworthy because they wanted to know about their children. They, you know, it, it was a process. And I think one of the paradoxes in the globalized media is it works much better locally than it does any other way at this point. There's more trust. If you show pictures of these are your cousins, you, you, you know whether they are or they aren't. This is your town, you know whether it is or isn't. You show the other side of the world, it's more difficult to know. So I think that there's you know, a lot of work to be done you know, locally you know, to build up a sense of what's real and not real as well. The argument about showing death and dying in hospitals and and so on, we saw so many images of exhausted health workers, and you know, and there's so many people to talk to. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it, to see more and more death and dying, people also shut off from it too. Like the concentration camps, you stop looking. So, you know, I, when I was picture the New York Times, there's a certain amount I wouldn't publish because you don't wanna just, just create the shock, shock, shock. You know, the old, the poids de mots, the shock des photos, the very match, the weight of the words, the shock of the photos. You do not wanna do that. So there, there are many, many ways of thinking about this. Um, and it's not just a problem of photography, it's a problem of media in general, you know, Facebook and so on and so forth. Like, you know, the, the bubbles that, that we were talking about before that, that we all inhabit at this point. We only wanna know, you know, that's why the first book I wrote about this in 1990 was called In Our Own Image, The Coming Revolution of Photography. We want to create the world in our own image. We don't want to know anything else. And, and that's problematic. Um, you know, that's, that's a long answer to a short question, but this may uh, Joe, I have some questions for you that have come in. One is, how do you photograph people who deny reality in a compassionate way? 
Oh, uh, we can and, have a and whole... second, just to, just to tie onto that, what equipment do you use to shoot? Okay. Uh, the equipment, I don't usually spend much time speak, speaking about equipment because I don't pay too much attention to the gear that I use. I use everything that clicks, basically. So I, unfortunately, I'm not able to photograph well with my cell phone. If I would, I would definitely use it. But I usually use cameras, anything from 35 millimeter digital cameras to 8 by 10 film cameras. So it's a range of things. It depends on how I want to approach how do I want to have the optical quality of things? And at the same time, how much gear do I want to carry when I'm doing a story? So it really varies on that. How do I photograph someone who denies reality in uh, what was the a compassionate way, right? Yeah. Uh, that's a very complex question, but so, something tells me that we don't always have to be compassionate and we don't always have to be quote unquote good Christians when you, we're photographing. If we're photographing someone that I don't feel compassionate about, I don't see a reason why that photo photograph should bring compassion. What I do honestly always try, no matter who's uh, in front of me, is to put myself on his or her shoes and try to understand where that person's coming from. And that oftentimes creates compassion with the relationship between me and that person. And that if it translates to a photograph being compassionate, great. If it doesn't, great. So I was photographing uh, the military who were accused for crimes against humanity and I had their faces. Uh, I had, and some pictures that I show have their faces on it and they're important pictures because N those people's names were known to the Argentine public, but most people did not know their faces. So they were a key document to have in order to put names and faces together and understand who was the person being accused of what crime. But at the same time, that image sort of became iconic because they're hiding their faces. And at the same time, to me, it's also important that I somehow protect their privacy. Although I don't feel obliged to it and but I, I think there's an interesting game there of like i'm not if that person's child or grandchild sees him he will probably recognize him but his neighbor won't uh and so i think there's a, a matter of respect that we we must seek but at the same time at sometimes we need to call things by their names and people being accused and convicted by crimes against humanity I don't necessarily have to be compassionate about that. The reality, I think it's, or people that question reality. And let's take an example, global warming, for example. Uh, I try, and this goes with life, I would say, I'm trying to spend less time with people that I'm not deeply caring about and not waste my energy on those stories and rather focus on stories that I'm, completely committed and involved emotionally with. Uh, so yes, I would like to be doing 15 or 20 stories a year like I used to 15 years ago. Right now I'm probably doing three or four, but I would rather, and that's also to add to a little bit to what Fred was saying. Uh, I think I should be a, somehow trying to become an expert on the stories that I cover not only from a photographic perspective, but from a human perspective, from a journalistic perspective, from an historical perspective, in order to really understand what's in front of me, in order to capture those images, but also to step back from that. And when I'm editing for a book, which is what I'm doing right now, really try to put things into perspective and into context is super, super important. Because as we are producing billions of images every year, the one photograph that I want people to spend more than three seconds on Instagram looking at it. If I want to do it, I need to create a context for it. And the context is not only text, is maybe when I'm doing a show, create a scenario to, pe to put people on it in order to create an environment, a specific environment that will trigger them something, some memories. And that is to me as a photographer, as an author, 
that is really what I'm willing to spend the next 20 years of my life doing is not so much running around trying to make the deadlines for a newspaper, which I, I still enjoy whenever I get those assignments, but it needs to be in stories that I can be, I can be different. It's not the story of going into some place that I don't speak the language, that I don't understand the reality. If that happens, I would rather stay there for weeks or months in order to really understand what's going on. And that is very hard today with the resources that exist on the media. So one needs to pick its battles, right? So I'm trying to do that on a more like local or local, I don't mean by the like, the, my neighborhood kind of thing because I don't have one neighborhood but the areas that I've spent time and enjoyed spending time and trying to get myself a little bit more expert on it. I think we have time for two more questions. Um, one is very local, very specific. Um, does the name, um, excuse me, Vivian Mayer mean anything to either one of you? Yeah. The question uh, is, uh, yeah. Well, yes. what about Vivian Mayer, the nanny in Chicago, and her very private photos of the city around her. No, I mean, it's, it's great. There's many, many people who've done that. There's many, you know, Artigue was, was an amateur photographer. There are many, many people who worked that way. And now, with, you know, as Joe was talking and I was talking with cell phones, there's more and more people working that way all, all over the world, uh, all the time, you know. I mean, one of the great things to do in the next 10, 15 years, if you're getting a PhD, is do the social media archives. What is there? Because we have no that's, idea what's there. That's precisely uh, what I was going to say is like the, what really stresses me about the social media right now is like, where are those images being kept? Who's cataloging them? what's how do we going to look at these photographs in 50 years from now like we are now looking at images from the vietnam war for example we know they're there we know they're at the library of congress they're at the international center of photography they're in certain institutions the current archives they die whenever this cell phone dies you know like most people don't even back them up so just vanish so it's really a challenge in the next 10 to 15 i would say even more than that like how to compile those images and create something out of that in terms of archive. No, because Marjorie, to answer your earlier introduction about the COVID virus, if somebody curated imagery from social media of people sick and dying of COVID, there's gonna be a lot of imagery out there. It's just that we're not seeing it, it's not being curated. And I think professional organizations are way behind the times, you know, like in the world of photography, for example, or journalism, and not giving sufficient credit to all that kind of work that's being done worldwide at this point. So it, it's, you know, like everything else, it takes a long time for us to understand how much things have changed. You know, in 10, 20 years, we're gonna make a great discovery of what 2020 was like in social media, um, but it's gonna take a while. The final question that I have, which is extremely general, and can maybe sum up this entire conversation is that, Fred, I would say that you, in talking about the impact of photography, are talking about being an activist photography, photographer, excuse me, something that's going to lead to action and that is immediate. It seems to me that Zhao has emphasized being a historical photographer, which is dealing with memory more than action and documentation rather than immediate impact. How do these two perspectives influence the photo that each of you would take? I realize you're not a photographer, Fred. No, it's, again, it, it's, it's, it's complicated. You see, if you talk about the medium, but not the world, it, it's, it kind of disconnects. So a lot of, my thinking about how imagery can be used today in the context of where the world is, is what kind of impact can it have? How can it push things forward? Where will it move us? So those imagery 20, 30, 40 years from now will be seen differently than, than, than we see them. You know, all photographs are historical 
picture, if I make an image, it's already the history because by the time you see it, it's the past. It's always the past. So it's always history. Um, so, but how can it be effective and useful now? Yes, I, I don't know if I'd call it, you know, when I worked at the New York Times, was I an activist? No, I was a journalist, but I was still concerned with trying to interpret contemporary events in a useful way. So we don't just repeat, you know, the spectacle, the sensational, the, the stereotype and so on, but, but we get somewhere else. And I think, you know, that's, that's, that's what we're looking at now. And, you know, the historical is, we've talked a lot about archives and, and how all this filters into archives and will be useful perhaps at some day in some way. Um, but, you know, a lot of that is also gonna involve good contextualization because they get reinterpreted so many, so many different ways uh, too. I mean, I, I was teaching yesterday and I was looking at an iconic image um, from Egypt that nobody, you know, I've never seen before, an iconic image from Tunisia I've never seen before. How do they contextualize within their own cultures? What do they mean in those cultures? You know, there's, we have a lot of work to do in terms of, you know, putting that all together. So to me, they meld together the historical, the present and the future. I don't see them as, as, as that distinct, but go ahead, Joao. Yeah, I totally agree with Fred Marjorie. I would not separate memory from action. Uh, I think a lot of our action today uh, is not only driven by current events, but also from what we've learned from the past, hopefully. Uh, so that's why I think in 2020 and 21, we are also in alert because of certain movements that are rising around the globe. And that is creating like memories from the past and the, those light bulbs blinging again is like oh wait I, we've heard this in 1933 uh, and i think that derives from memory and what i'm when i say i'm deeply concerned about history is not only about history as fred says i click it's past is history but is also how this will be seen and what we'll learn from these events in 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now. I'm just like throwing in the ball into the future and giving, and I say this because, again, is not only taking the photograph, is creating the context, is putting it in the right place, is having the right text, is having the right environment to explain what was going on in certain images that we're watching. Uh, that will hopefully, and I, we can only hope for that in 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, when we think about COVID-19, we can look at certain images and think, okay, this was what happened. How, what mistakes were made back then and how can we avoid them now? And I think this can be said for World War I or the Vietnam War or even last traumatic and dramatic events. Uh, but that's only to speak of that those major and global issues that we've been talking about here. But we can say, how can we preserve traditions? You know, like bread making the natural way, you can create a visual document of that and hopefully people will use it whenever corn is only made out of Monsanto seeds and the... the the old seeds are gone. I don't know. I'm just making it up here. But I think there's a lot of ways to create action from or reaction from action, but also there's a lot of ways to create action from memories. I want to thank both of you. This is a really, really interesting and important conversation. And I'm sorry that we're not doing a series. This sounds like the beginning of something rather than just one episode. Um, on behalf of the Arts Arena, I'm delighted that we were able to bring together Columbia's Institute for Ideas and Imagination with Joao Pina with an Arts Arena uh, regular, I think I can say, Fred Richen, and I thank both of you. I thank Marie, the Institute, also Columbia Global Centers, Michelle for his technical help, James and Sam, who have done everything to make this happen, and I sincerely hope that we can do this again and continue. A pleasure, and thank you, Marjorie, and thanks to everybody for organizing. 
Thanks for, and thank, for coming. Thanks to all of you who joined us viewing from your homes. And next, next year in person with a live audience.